Once again, London's climate asks, what even is autumn? And then lurches straight into winter. And so while winter sinks its teeth in, I contemplate how to warm myself up from the inside. So welcome to another episode of Kinetic Energy, Heat and Time. It looks like eat, but it's not. It's the part before that. And today what we're trying to achieve is an evaporated source. I don't know if that's a thing, but if it's not, I'm going to make it one. And the way this is going to operate is sort of like we're going to be making a perfume that's edible. So we've got an alcoholic base that's going to serve as a nice leveler and then around it, we're going to build notes that are going to sort of counteract winter and work exceptionally well with red meat. So we've got an array of things here. We've got high notes, mid notes and low notes. And so if I, and then everything's changed. The layout is now in note order. So it's all based around the wine and it's either meant to work above it, below it or with it. So on the low end, we've got smoked garlic. We've got some roasted cacao nibs and celery salt. It'll work really well with what I'm gonna pair it with. Porcini mushrooms, giving it a nice umami hit. We've got some juniper berries, which are going to be a little bit peppery, a little bit sweet. And then finally, some licorice root. Not all of that, but that's going to give it another sort of like aniseedy sweetness that's just sort of unmistakable. And then finally on top, we've got all our sort of accenting, cutting flavors. We've got pepper, which sits right on the tip of your tongue. We've got the sage, which is the most perfumey thing on here, if I'm quite honest, and that sort of laces through everything, and that's our anchor herb. And then finally, we've got orange peel, and it's gonna give us a nice sort of sharp note that sort of sits on top of the wine, but sort of blends into it nicely. So, it's assembly time. All the ingredients that need to be broken down have. And I've chosen a conical flask this time for mixing as opposed to a beaker. The idea here is that some, will, some evaporation will escape out the top, but the angled sides of the glass will hopefully collect a bit more condensation than what's usual and cause it to drip back down into the glass, slowing down the rate of evaporation, but increasing the amount of time that the ingredients have got to infuse. Therefore, increasing the depth of flavor and by the end, hopefully getting a nice syrupy finish. ingredient is patience. It's currently with all the solids sitting at about 500 milliliters. So I'm going to let that get to at least 350 before I even consider straining it out. But already you can see the condensation starting to collect around the side, sloped sides of the conical flask. And everything seems to be going pretty well. All right, so it's time to go get some ingredients. I'm gonna head down the road to see Enos and see what he's got in stock today. And then I'll get back. This is still reducing. It's been quite a few hours now, but the smell coming from it is absolutely incredible. So I think they're gonna to need to do a little bit of uh, fine tuning with the flavors. Add a little bit of uh, this and a little bit of that just to make sure that it's got that perfect balance and we should be good. Here he is. And 
and we're back. In that lovely little shop down the road, we've got some Brussels sprouts. Gonna give them a little bit of a chop. They're gonna get into the frying pan with a, just a hint of garlic and some olive oil and they're gonna be caramelized. Potatoes, they're gonna get grated up and turned into a beautiful, crunchy, fatty rosti. Then we've got three things here that are gonna be steamed. So these are gonna be, the courgette's gonna be sliced lengthways, nice and thin, as are the purple carrots. And they're all gonna get steamed together and then they're gonna take a little, a little bit of a bath and a bit of flavor, some salt and a tiny, tiny touch of vinegar, just to give them a really delicate pickle. We've got a beautiful selection of mushrooms here, so we're gonna turn that into a beautiful um, umami mushroom array. And we've got some decorative and nutty flavors. We've got edible flowers, peppery cress, and we've got some nuts here. Well, we've got uh, organic walnuts, and we've also got some uh, pumpkin seeds, and so they're gonna get chopped up and they're gonna get laid out across the top of that rosti. It's gonna be fantastic. And then finally, Barnsley chop. Simple bit of salt, pepper, hard fry in my brand new cast iron frying pan. And then it's all gonna to come together with that sauce. But first we're gonna finish off the sauce. And so we'll crack on with that one first. So we're at that stage where we need to do a little bit of uh, fine tuning and just if you follow your nose you can smell that it's still just a little bit sharp so we need to smooth off those edges a little bit we need to give it a little bit of Mary Poppins a spoonful of sugar brown sugar not my namesake but this will give it a nice sort of uh, sweetness that hopefully will bring out most of the flavors from what we've added in there already so in it goes You can already sort of smell the sweetness kicking in. Almost lost my bloody eyebrows. So it's all dressed up and ready to go. And this uh, rosti, it's just so crispy. We've got the beautiful, beautiful bit of Barnsley chop from Field and Flower, that's fantastic. And I've just poured the sauce over and we're gonna see how it all goes together. Let's go in with a bit of, uh, bit of Brussels sprout and a nice fatty bit from those fatty love handles of a Barnsley chop. And we'll see how it goes. Mm. It sits together with that meat incredibly well, but we should sort of expect that. The, the sauce itself is quite tart. It's got a little bit of a sweet undertone and it's got quite a few things going on in there. But the lamb, it's so gamey and it's so, so intensely umami that it sort of needs that to cut through it a little bit. It'll probably give it a bit more legs. So all of these ingredients on the plate are really simply done. There's nothing too complicated going on in there. They're just speaking for themselves and the sauce is sort of the spotlight. It actually might be the other way around. Maybe the sauce is the hero and the ingredients are the spotlight, but who knows? Either way, it's delicious. It just goes to show what can be done with a bit of kinetic energy, a little bit of heat, and sometimes, in this case, a lot of time. It's something you can probably replicate at home. And I would encourage you to try it out. It doesn't have to be the ingredients I used, but, you know, find yourself a base, find yourself a few notes that you want to express in your sauce, 
and give it a go. The worst thing you can do is screw it up. Every screw up's a lesson. I mean, I didn't screw up this one, but it could have easily gone south. Either way, this all comes together really nicely. And for me, it definitely beats those uh, incoming winter feelings. It's still got a little bit of vibrancy to it as well.